Hi class. Dr. Jim here. Next chapter. We're up to chapter 8 and we're going to be looking primarily at bacterial metabolism. Now really if you've had a biology class before or probably in AMP you've talked about metabolism already and this is really what we're looking at is cell respiration. And so we're going to hit it again. We're going to talk about enzymes and what they do and so this will be another review for you guys. So I know a lot of you have already had AMP, probably most of you. And so this should be a good review for you guys. So we're going to be looking at metabolism. There's not a lot of difference between a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryote. The big difference is you have to remember is prokaryotes don't have organelles. And so we don't have mitochondria. We don't have to worry about that. And the electron transport doesn't take place in the membrane of the mitochondria. It actually takes place in the cell, cell membrane of the bacteria. So that's what makes it a little bit different. And so that's your biggest difference. No mitochondria. Everything happens in the cytoplasm except for electron transport, which takes place in the bacterial membrane. And so that's primarily the big difference between the bacterial and eukaryotic. Pretty much the steps are all the same. And so, and, I, and I'm not one of a big proponent that you have to know every single step of glycolysis and Krebs cycle and everything else. That is for biochemistry. So you may have learned that in a and and they may have drilled that into your head to know every step. You have to know that for biochemistry, but for this class, you don't. All I want you to know is what goes in, what comes out, and where does it take place. Okay, fair enough? All right, let's move on and let's talk about chapter 8. So what, what we're looking at today is first we'll talk about metabolism, and so we'll talk about both catabolism and anabolism. So catabolism is breaking things down. Animalism is building things up, so we'll talk about those. We'll get a nice review of what are enzymes, and so again, enzymes are proteins, and those proteins have activity that lower the rate of activity in the reaction, so they speed things up. I always like to refer to enzymes as the power tools of the biological world, because they allow you to do things much faster, more efficiently, and you get things done faster, and so that's those types of things. And again, we'll talk about what affects enzyme function, but if you remember from last time, where we talked about growth, it's the same things. You got your pH, you got your temperature, you've got, you know, things like osmosis and things like that that can affect it. And so those are all these different things that can affect enzyme function, concentration, things like that. So we're going to look at those things again and just briefly talk about it. We'll then get into the steps of aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration is the thing that you've talked about, whether you've had ANP or biology or any of those things. Again, what does it generate? ATP. We've seen that molecule before when we looked at chapter two, and we talked about ATP. That's the energy currency of the cell. And we'll talk about the three steps involved, glycolysis, Krebs, and electron transport. I'm then going to talk about anaerobic respiration. Now, this is one of the things that your ANP instructor probably got wrong. Okay, so if you had a really good AMP instructor, they would have said we did a process called fermentation. And that's what we do when we don't breathe oxygen. We actually ferment and we make lactic acid. A lot of times what happens is it gets misunderstood and we call this anaerobic respiration. Fortunately, that is not true. Bacteria do anaerobic respiration because they can use other molecules other than oxygen to go through all those steps, glycolysis, Krebs, and electron transport. In our world, we can't do that. We can't go through all steps. When we go through and we don't have oxygen available, we go directly to fermentation. We call it lactic acid buildup or aerobic or anaerobic, uh, and it's not respiration. So again, that's where your AMP instructor is wrong. So if you do see your AMP instructor and they told you that it was anaerobic respiration, you can tell them they're wrong. And so they love to hear when they, you tell them that they're wrong about something. And then finally, we'll briefly, and I mean very briefly, like go through it in about two minutes about photosynthesis. Again, I don't spend a lot of time on it because it's not really one of those focuses that we really need to know in this class. I don't ask any questions on the test about it, but I think it's just good general knowledge just to know a little bit about it so you don't look dumb when someone asks you, what is photosynthesis? And so again, it's always nice to say, aha, I know the answer and tell people, hey, I can... I know a little bit about it. So that's the only reason why I bring it up. And so again, it's it's an important process, but we really don't cover it that much here in this class. All right, so let's move on and see what we got. And so the first thing we're looking at is metabolism. And again, metabolism is all chemical and physical workings of the cell. And you have the two types. You have catabolism, which is the breaking down of something. So when I go and eat a sandwich and I break those things down into the proteins, the carbohydrates, 
uh, the lipids, and then even the nucleic acids, that's all part of catabolism. That's breaking these bonds down so that I can get it to the root, so I can get it to glucose, so I can feed my cells, so I can make ATP. Now, let's say I'm going later on to the club, you know, or to the gym and working out. And so when I work out, I want to build up muscle. I want to get bigger and that stuff. And that is anabolism. Anabolism is when you build things. So you put things together. This can be as simple as putting glucose molecules together to form starch or glycogen. Could be building protein molecules to build muscle. It could be also other things like building cell membranes with lipids and other things like that, or even reconstructing your DNA. All those processes is called anabolism. You're building things up. So catabolism is breaking down. Anabolism is building up, and metabolism is the sum of all those reactions, okay? And so that's what happens there. All right, now one of the things that we need in order to do metabolism are enzymes. If we went it alone, we would be very, very inefficient. We wouldn't be able to sustain life if we, couldn't, if we didn't have the enzymes present that allow us to do these things. Enzymes help us lower the ener energy of activation. And so down here in this drawing, they do a really good example of showing you. This is a reactant. Remember, reactants are always on the left-hand side. Well, I should say here, left-hand side. And if you have your sum, the products are over here. And so what happens is your reactant is what gets reacted on, and then you make your product. So left side, right side. So if you look at this graph, what happens is a lot of times you need a lot of energy to change those reactants into products, okay? Whether you're breaking bonds or putting bonds together. That energy either has to be stored or it has to be used to break those bonds apart, okay? And when that happens, you need something to generate that push, okay? It's like rolling a boulder up a hill. So they always use this in chemistry, and I don't understand why. I can kind of see the metaphor, but it's not the clearest metaphor in the world, but it's kind of like you rolling a boulder to the top of the hill. You're going to put energy in to roll that boulder up the hill so that you can watch it roll down the hill, okay? When you put that energy in, that's the energy of activation to get you to get that boulder up to the hill, and then it rolls down the hill, and that's the energy that uses to break the product or to make the product, okay? When you have an enzyme, what the enzyme is, is kind of like a motorized cart. Now you use less energy, you can get up that hill a lot easier for yourself and then drop the boulder off the hill and let it roll. Same metaphor that I like to use is power tools, okay? You can build a house with your hands and nails and everything else and you could use a lot of energy, a lot of people. But if I give you power tools, you're gonna build that house a lot faster, okay? And so that's the idea. The enzymes allow you to do things faster, more efficiently, and with less energy. And so that's why we think of enzymes as the power tools of the biological world, okay? In these reactions, the enzyme is never permanently destroyed or altered in the reaction. And so those enzymes can be used again and again and again until the enzyme falls apart. And that could be very quickly. It could be very long. Some enzymes last a very long time. Others are only a short period of time, depending on the environment that they're in. And so that can play a big role in that. And again, the enzyme promotes the reaction. And so when we call these things, we typically talk about the substrate or the reactant as a substrate. So we're going to change the name of reactant to substrate now, even though it's the same thing. You can interchange those substrate or reactant. The substrate is always on the left-hand side. Your product is on the right. The enzyme works on the substrate. The substrate then converts into the product once this is done. And that's the process of, a, of metabolism. So again, the structure of an enzyme Basically, enzymes are proteins. So we talk about the basic structure of an enzyme is protein, okay? And so all enzymes are proteins, but not all proteins are enzymes. So if you remember that rule, all enzymes are proteins, you'll always understand where these things come from. Although there are some cases where you have cofactors and coenzymes. So if you remember when I was talking about those elements that we need sometimes, very small amounts like iron, manganese, uh, magnesium, things like this, these are all cofactors that bind to enzymes. They're kind of like this, the start button. Without these things, the enzymes don't really work very well. So when we have these things, they're added to the enzymes and they make the enzymes work even better. It's kind of like the lithium battery to your, your, power, or your um, cordless screw gun. Okay, Think of it that way. It's kind of the battery pack. Without it, the enzyme doesn't run. And so we call these things, again, the apoenzyme is the protein portion of it. And then the cofactors are the non-metallic or the coenzymes that are associated with it. So you can kind of things, or I'm sorry, metallic, or the coenzymes that are associated with those things. So think of it like the battery pack to power your uh, power tool, okay? And so that's the enzyme structure, but just remember that the whole protein itself is the, is, or the whole enzyme itself is called the holoenzyme, 
and again, protein and then cofactors, but most of the time it's mostly protein. Again, one of the nice rules that I always tell everyone whenever they take one of my classes, if you see ACE, see this ACE here, ACE, 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 when you see ACE in the biological world, that means enzyme. That means it does something. Okay, so if you go on and take more classes in science and that stuff and you go on and you see ACE, I want you automatically to think enzyme. Okay, if you think of that, you're always you're never gonna go wrong. 95% of enzymes end in ACE, and that's because they do something in the cell. Okay, so you're gonna see this ACE and you're gonna think enzyme every time. Okay, and that's important. So we have lots of different enzymes. You can see they all end in ACE in this case, and like I said, there are a few that don't. But most of them do, and again, they do something in the cell. Catalase breaks down hydrogen peroxide. Oxidase adds electrons to oxygen. Hexokinase uh, transfers phosphate to glucose. Urease splits urea into ammonium. Nitrate reductase splits nitri or reduces nitrate to nitrite. And the DNA polymerase builds DNA. And so all these different things have a function. And so again, what you notice, though, is they have one role. And so enzymes only have one role in life, and that is to do the one thing that they're made to do, okay? They don't go off and do other things for other, other reactions or anything else. And so you basically have one tool for one job, and that's it. So it's a little inefficient in that point, but always remember, the enzyme will only do one thing, okay? And it has one reaction to do, and that's it. And so that's the important thing. And here you can see a lot of them require cofactors that allow them, that's kind of the battery pack that allows them to go. All right. All right. So let's see how enzymes work. So we'll start this off and all. Enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions in the cell. A special region on the enzyme called the active site has a shape that fits with specific substrate molecules. An enzyme works by binding to one or more specific molecules called reactants or substrates. Binding occurs at the active site. The enzyme and substrates form an enzyme-substrate complex. The interactions between the substrates and the enzyme stresses or weakens some of the chemical bonds in the substrates. These stresses encourage a link between the two substrates, leading to the formation of a different molecule. As a result of the chemical interactions within the active site, a new product is formed. The product is released from the active site, the enzyme assumes its original shape and is free to work again. Although this reaction has specifically illustrated the formation of a single product from two substrate molecules, other enzymes catalyze the formation of two products from a single substrate. Okay, so in this video, hopefully you got a little bit out of that where it kind of shows you this is a case where you had two substrates going in and making one product. That is a synthesis re reaction. Remember when we were talking about that in chemistry? When you put two substrates together and form one product, you get a synthesis. When you have one substrate and you form two products, that is a degradation. And so that's the breakup or the catalyzation process. And so that's the same thing that we talked about back in chapter two. See, I told you things would build on one another. And so this is where it goes. And so in this case, it was showing you a synthesis reaction where you're putting two substrates together and forming one product. Again, you see that the enzymes and the substrates do bind and form a complex. Could be very quickly when this happens. Sometimes they take a little bit longer. But you always see that the product comes off this enzyme and the enzyme goes back to its original conformation and then can do it again and again and again. So that's the key in the, this video. All right. And again, we talk about the specificity for the active site. The active site is where the substrate or substrates will bind. And so again, that plays a role with the way that the levels of protein folded. Again, here's another place where these things come together. Remember, primary structure is what the amino acid order is or what the paper looks like. The secondary is the individual folds. The tertiary is how the whole structure looks. And then again, sometimes you have subunits that will form the active site. In this case, you have the quaternary structure. So, and you can see they show active sites here. These are the sites where the substrates bind. So when you think of active site, think substrate binds in this place, okay? All right, and so again, you can always think of the induced fit model when you're talking about substrates binding to enzymes. The active site is in the shape of the substrate. So again, specificity is very important. Only one substrate will fit into that active site. And so this is the case in this situation, the substrate will fit in. This substrate does not fit in because it doesn't fit the model. 
and so this can't bind this one can and you get the products same way down here again you see down here the same thing happens the substrate can fit in the enzymes break it apart and then this would be a new reaction or a degradation reaction where you have one substrate two products okay all right other things cofactors can play a role in fitting in and so again this just shows you how cofactors can act as a way for these things to bind and so again the final uh, cysteine in the enzyme activity and so that's why cofactors are important like I said those are kind of the battery packs for these proteins to work okay, and do their function all right and then we talk a little bit about exoenzymes versus endo and if you remember from my last lecture exo means out endo means in exoenzymes are ones that are secreted outside by bacteria that do things outside the bacteria cell and so we'll get some different types of uh, reactions and things like this. We're going to talk about these things later on in the semester. Cellulase, amylase, penicillase are all enzymes that get secreted outside the bacteria cell. These get to either break down food products, break down you, or break down antibiotics. And so these are all different things that get broken down by enzymes that are made by the bacteria. Endoenzymes stay inside the cell, and so these are used again inside the cell, and these are to either do typical metabolism for bacteria, breaking things down inside the bacteria cell. So remember, exo out, endo in, and there will be a question on the test about that, so make sure you remember that. Okay, and then we also have constitutive versus regulated. Constitutive means it's on all the time. It's a light switch that's turned on all the time. Enzymes are made constantly. So there's no regulation to it. The, 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 the cell itself is going to make this enzyme over and over and over again, and it never shuts off. It's kind of like a light switch that is taped up that they never want you to touch. The lights are always on so that you can see. So kind of like the hallway lights that you see in the building here. In the building, you always have the lights on, and that's because they want to have nice, bright hallways for people to see that are nice and safe. Now, regulated enzymes are, are basically enzymes that are turned on and off. And we're going to talk about this in Chapter 9 when we get into the next unit uh, of Chapter 9, which is Part 2. And we're going to talk about regulation of turning things on and off. And these are part of what we call operons and turning things on and turning things off. So think about these being turned on and off like a light switch. So like when we come into the room, we want to turn the lights on. So we want to turn the enzyme on. When we leave the room, we shut them off. And so that's a regulated enzyme. You can turn them on and turn them off when needed. Okay, so that's just kind of how those things are. So you have ones that are always made and some that are regulated. And that's what that, those two things mean. All right, and then we talked about synthesis versus degradation. And again, the simple rule behind synthesis, two substrates, one product. That's a synthesis reaction. You're taking two substrates, putting them together, and forming one product. So remember that. Degradation or dehydration, uh, and oh, I guess this is just showing dehydration in this case, and again, removing of water. And we've talked about this already in Chapter 2, where when you put these things together, this is called dehydration synthesis. You take some water, you take a molecule of water out, and you form a bond. And that, again, is done by enzymes. And so, again, when we talk about synthesis, two substrates, one product. When we talk about degradation, degradation is having one substrate, two products in this case, but they don't really show it here. I misread it when I was reading it. So just remember synthesis, uh, synthesis and then dehydration because you take water out of this reaction. Here is the opposite reaction. I knew it was coming up is the hydrolysis reaction. And the hydrolysis reaction is where basically you add water to the reaction to break the bonds. So again, you have one product here, even though it looks like they're two substrates, this is actually one substrate. And what happens is, is now you end up with two products. And so what you do is you add water to the reaction. The water breaks the bond. The bond breaks, and now you have two products. And again, this is with the aid of the enzyme. And so this is how metabolism works. You have enzymes that build things up. You have enzymes that break things down. And so it's that collection of all those different enzymes and those different substrates and products that work together to form your metabolism. And so that's kind of what we look at. When you gain a lot of weight, you're building and you're putting things together. When you lose a lot of weight, you're breaking things apart more efficiently. And so that's kind of what you want to think about when you think of metabolism. Okay, same thing in the bacterial world. All right, so when we talk about an enzyme, what is an enzyme? Does it become part of the final products? Is it nonspecific? Is it consumed by the reaction? May it be active extracellularly or is composed only of protein? What is the correct answer? 
Okay, if you said D, you're actually correct. You think about exo and endoenzymes. Enzymes can work outside. We call those exoenzymes. Now, I bet a few of you thought it was E, that they were only composed of protein, and that is correct. However, you got to remember there are cofactors and coenzymes that actually play a role too. So this is not always the case. There are some that are only protein, but there are cofactors and other things involved. So this one is not correct. Think of it as an always type of thing, always composed of only a protein, and that is not correct. So D is the correct answer here. All right, so we look at the sensitivity of enzymes in their environment, and again, we talk about how enzymes react, and again, enzymes are proteins, remember, and, and cofactors and things like this, and proteins can be degraded under different conditions. And so again, temperature plays a role, pH and osmotic pressure all play a role in how enzymes function. And so when we talk about growth and those factors, think of growth factors affecting proteins or affecting enzymes. And so those things will play a huge role. And again, sometimes enzymes fall apart. When they're chemically unstable enzymes, we call those libel enzymes that basically they fall apart. And when the protein does fall apart, and it falls apart and it can't be put back together, we call that denaturation, where the protein just unfolds and comes into a big floppy mess. And so that's called denaturation. And so this happens when we overheat something. So when you're cooking something, like you're cooking something on the grill or cooking something on the stove, a lot of times when you have something that has protein in it, you're denaturating the bonds and that changes it. And so the object looks a lot different. So I take a piece of meat, you know, how you have that nice red meat and you put it onto the grill, comes out nice and brown. The reason for that is because you're changing the proteins and those proteins are changing structure. And so it changes the color and everything else that's associated with it. So that's part of that process. And denaturation is a falling apart of proteins or enzymes in this situation. All right, another effect on enzymes is how we can inhibit them. So you have either competitive inhibition or non-competitive inhibition. Competitive means is that there you have a substrate that is fighting for the same active site as the substrate. So you remember back to my example where you have the enzyme and the substrate. The substrate binds in the enzyme and it's very specific. Well, you there are molecules out there that are very similar to the substrate that can actually block the active site. A lot of our drugs that we take as prescriptions work this way. If we have an overactive enzyme somewhere in our body, we can take a drug to stop that enzyme from working by blocking it. And that's through competitive inhibition. And there are some, like if you've ever had blood problems, blood clotting problems or anything, you may have taken a drug like Coumadin. Coumadin or Warfarin as it's better known as, is something that will keep you from clotting your blood. However, if you're on those drugs, you have to be very careful because too much of it is a bad thing because you could bleed to death. Likewise, too little, and you could clot to death. And so it's a very uh, risky situation. But what that drug does is actually blocks the active sites so that you can't do blood uh, clotting of your blood. Okay, that's an example of competitive inhibition. A non-competitive inhibition is basically where you have another site on the enzyme that blocks the enzyme. Okay, and so one of the best examples I have is when I use scissors. So let me grab a pair of scissors, and I'll show you exactly what I mean here, and maybe you can see this or not. So we'll take my little trusty little airplane here and the paper, okay? So here's my active site. My paper can fit in just like this, okay? And I cut the paper, okay? Let's say now I have something that will block it, this pen. If I block the active site, that is competitive inhibition, okay? I can't cut the paper anymore. No matter how, try, how hard I try, I can't cut because it's blocking it, okay? That's competitive because I'm blocking the site where the paper goes. Now, a non-competitive would be if I blocked another site within the scissors, and now I can't squeeze the scissors. Now, it's squeezing out a little bit, but again, what it does is prevents me from squeezing these scissors closed, and I can't cut the paper. And that is considered non-competitive because it's not in the active site. The active site is still open. You see the active site is still open. The paper could fit in there. The problem is, is that I can't cut with the scissors. And so, again, you're blocking the activity of those things from actually working. And so that's called non-competitive inhibition, okay? And so some of the examples they have on this thing is enzyme repression. And so that is basically where you inhibit the enzyme or you repress it from controlling it genetically, or you induce enzymes that are only made when substrates are present. And so, again, we're going to look at this in Chapter 9 in the next unit, so we'll talk more about that then. But this is a way to do it through genetics and other ways of either turning enzymes on or off. So 
What I really want you to get out of it is the difference between competitive, which means blocking the active site, and non-competitive binding to a different site that affects the active site. Okay, and this just shows you here. Here's competitive. Here's my substrate. Here's my competitive inhibitor. In this case, the substrate wins and the reaction proceeds. In this case, the inhibitor wins, and now the enzyme is blocked. Okay, and that's competitive inhibition. Non-competitive, you have the substrate and the active site, but now you have this regulatory site. That regulatory site is where this other inhibitor will bind. And so you can see in this case, there's no inhibition. The reaction proceeds. And in this situation, the regulatory site, now you have a regulatory, it changes the active site, so now the substrate can't bind. And so essentially you stop the reaction. It's kind of like my scissors. And so hopefully that worked for you and got something out of it. All right, so that's regulation of enzyme activity. Okay, also repression, again, this is where you can actually block things by binding to the DNA. And again, we're going to talk about this again in chapter nine, so I won't spend too much time here, but essentially what happens is the substrate can act, or the products can act as a way to inhibit uh, regulation or bind to the DNA so that you don't get transcription of the enzyme. And so that's a way to shut it off. And so again, we'll talk about this in chapter nine when we get to that. All right, and so this will show you again how feedback mechanisms block pathways. Many of the enzyme-catalyzed reactions that occur in a cell, such as those involved in the biosynthesis of an amino acid, are carried out in a specific sequence called a biochemical pathway. In such pathways, the product of one reaction becomes the substrate for the next reaction. If the end product of a pathway, such as an amino acid, becomes available in the environment, it is unnecessary and wasteful for the cells to continue to produce the product. Cells, therefore, have the ability to shut down a pathway when it is not needed. In feedback inhibition, the end product of the pathway reacts with the first enzyme that is unique to the pathway. The reaction occurs at a site on the enzyme that is different from the active site, called the allosteric site. When the product binds to the allosteric site, the enzyme undergoes a conformational change and can no longer react with its substrate. There is no substrate for subsequent steps in the pathway, and the final product is no longer synthesized. Okay, so in this example, it's showing you the non-competitive. So you made all this product, and once you get an assortment of product, this will prevent from making any more product. And so this is called feedback because basically you're making the product that ends up shutting down the system. And so what happens, non-competitive changes the active site and you no longer make any product. Once you run out of this product, this product will fall off, reopen, and the pathway will start again. And that's kind of how they describe this type of mechanism. All right, so here again is the characteristics as enzymes. And again, I'm not gonna go through this with you guys. You pretty much know this already. You've talked about it, you reviewed it and that stuff. And again, these are some of the things I'm not gonna go and sit there and did you read all these things and ask you on the test? You know, the basic structure, function, things that affect it. That's what I want, you know, competitive versus non-competitive and things like this, okay? So you can take a look at this on the handouts if you want to and just kind of look at it or pause the video and kind of look at it. But for now, don't worry about writing all these things down. I'm not gonna ask you for these things specifically on this checklist. All right, so let's talk about metabolism going into the pursuit of energy. And so now we're gonna get into the biochemical pathways and how do we make energy in the cell? Okay, so energy is the capacity to work and can cause change. And again, the forms of energy include thermal, radiant, electrical, mechanical, atomic, and chemical. And so these are the different types of energy that we use. Now, the ones that we're gonna be interested in is taking chemical, which is glucose, and converting it into mechanical, which is ATP. So that's what we're really gonna be talking about today, going from the chemical glucose and making mechanical energy, which is the ATP, which allows you to run your body, okay? And again, we talk about the cell energetics and breaking and making bonds. And again, endergonic reactions consume energy, and so energy goes in and basically with an enzyme makes a product. And exergonic reactions release energy. So again, you have these guys with the enzyme and then you get energy out of it. And so what we're gonna be talking about today is more of an exergonic overall reaction where you're gonna go through with glucose and you're gonna come out with ATP at the end. And so we're gonna look at these things. And again, energy release is temporarily stored in high energy molecules called ATP. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at today. All right, so cell energy, we have our glucose, 
go through the oxidation of glucose through um, glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, we generate these things and voila, we make ATP. And so that's the process and what we go through. And so again, we go from stored energy to again, storing that energy into ATP so that we can use it for mechanical energy. All right, same process that we've seen before in humans, same process that takes place in bacteria, just a little bit different areas and where these things take place. Okay, and again, we have these protein and electron carriers. Now, I'm not a big fan of you having you memorize all the numbers and everything else. I know some instructors want you to just memorize how many NADs and FADs and all these other things that are out there. I'm not that instructor. I want you to know that these things are out there, and this is kind of the link between glycolysis and Krebs to the electron transport chain. But for me, for you guys to have to memorize how many NADs do you make and how many FADs do you need and la la la. I think that's more busy work than anything. If you understand the pathway, why why worry about the individual steps? I don't know all the different NADs and FADs and everything else. I know that they're there. I know that they're important. But it's not one of those things that I'm going to slave over and have you guys be tested on it. It's not one of those things that's very important. What I think is important is that you understand what goes on in each reaction. And so that's why I do bring it up to show that you have a link between the NADs or the glycolysis and electron transport. But again, I don't, I'm not going to sit here in Harbor and see if you know how many NADs and FADs and things like this that you make during the, during their cell respiration. So don't worry about these things. We'll talk about them, but we don't need to know how many we make or anything else in these processes. Okay. So if a molecule has been reduced during a reaction, it has what? Lost oxygen, gain oxygen, lost electrons and hydrogens or gain electrons and hydrogens. Now, this is something I really don't talk about. If you remember back from chapter two, I briefly said something about it and reduction means making something more negative. So what do you think would make something more negative in this case? So that's a better way of saying it. So think about make, getting something more negative. What do you think that would be? Okay, if you said D, you are correct. So when you gain electrons, you're making things more negative. Okay, and so that's what reduction means. When you reduce something, you're making it more negative. And so that means you're gaining more electrons and hydrogens in this case. And so that's called reduction. When you lose oxygens and gain oxygens and things like that, it does play a role. But again, we're not going to worry about that. That's the oxidation part of it. And then losing electrons and hydrogen actually cause you to become oxidized. You're actually becoming more positive in this case. And so if you said D, this is the correct answer in this case. All right. So again, here's ATP. We've talked about ATP before, so I'm not going to spend a whole amount of time. And again, it's the adenine, the ribose sugar, and the three phosphate groups. Again, when we were talking about this in chapter two, I said the phosphate here between this bond between the two phosphates here is the high energy bond. This is where the energy is stored in those reactions for glycolysis. And so when you make ATP, that's where the energy is stored. When you break this bond, it releases the energy so that you can drive your cells. So we think of ATP as the energy currency of the cell. It's like that dollar bill you need to go buy your lunch, okay? You need those dollars to buy your lunch you need ATP to drive the cell. If you don't have any dollars, you're not going to get any lunch. If you don't have the ATP, you're not going to move your cells. And so that's the key. So think of it as the currency of your cell. This is how the cell works and survives with the ATP. Okay. And again, we talk about phosphorylation. So this is substrate level phosphorylation where you have glucose and then you take ADP and you actually add phosphates to the glucose molecule and you make glucose six phosphates. This is part of the process of glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. And this is called substrate level because you're doing it at the substrate. You're adding the phosphates on here and you're actually making or breaking ATP doing those types of reactions. Again, we're going to be talking more about the oxidative or using oxygen to produce oxidative phosphorylation, which is using oxygen to make lots of ATP at the end of the cycle. Okay, so like I said, we talked a little bit about substrate level phosphorylation. This is a transfer of phosphate groups, and so you take the phosphate from the phosphorylated substrate and make ATP. So that's phos substrate phosphorylation. 
you have oxidative phosphorylation, which is the redox reaction. So this is during electron transport. So this is where you make most of your ATP and where bacteria do this. And then you have photophosphorylation. And this is when it's done during photosynthesis. And again, obviously none of our cells do that because we don't do photosynthesis. Most bacteria don't do that. But there are a few that have pigments that allow you to do those types of things. And so you may run into those sometimes. But again, what we're primarily concerned with is the oxidative phosphorylation, so the electron transport, and then the substrate level phosphorylation, which is when you have the substrate glucose getting uh, removed the phosphate and adding it to ATP. All right, so bioenergetics is the study of cellular release. And again, the catabolism, when we think about catabolism, the main process is glucose being broken down. And again, this series of three steps, glycolysis, Krebs, and the respiratory train or chain or electron transport. Okay, again, what I want you to know out of this, I don't want you to know every step of the pathway. All I want you to know is what goes in, what comes out, and where does it take place. Okay, we'll keep it simple. All right, and again, metabolic strategies all depends on what the bacteria does. Most bacteria, again, do aerobic respiration, the same thing that we do where they breathe oxygen. They go through glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the respiratory chain. Anaerobic respiration is something new. You probably haven't discussed this. And again, if your AMP instructor said we do a anaerobic respiration, they're wrong because anaerobic respiration involves glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the respiratory chain in bacteria. However, instead of oxygen, we use things like nitrate, nitrite, sulfate, sulfite. Okay, so something other than oxygen is used during anaerobic respiration. So they don't need to breathe oxygen. They get it from nitrate or nitrite and do it that way. Okay, what we do when we don't have enough oxygen is go through fermentation. So when we're running a race or doing something like that and we are not breathing enough oxygen, we start to go through that process of fermentation. where We go through glycolysis, but then that glycolysis breaks down to pyruvate and then that pyruvate is broken down to lactic acid. And then the lactic acid builds in our muscles and then we cramp up and then we have to stop. That's the natural way of our body saying stop and breathe, okay? And so when you're cramping and things like this, it's telling you you're not getting enough oxygen to your muscles. This is what you need to do. You need to stop and breathe, okay? And so you get oxygen to the muscles and then you can redo aerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration is using another molecule other than oxygen to complete all three of those steps. So that's the big difference. So I want you to remember that because you're probably were told wrong in AMP. So make sure that you get that straight because I will ask some questions about anaerobic versus fermentation on the test. All right. So here's aerobic respiration. This is probably what you're familiar with. Glucose to pyruvate. Okay, this is glycolysis goes in as a pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA is then converted to CO2 during the Krebs cycle. Again, you make these NADHs and FADHs, which are promoted to the electron transport chain. And then voila, you go through and you use oxygen to generate ATP. The maximum amount of ATP produced is 38. And so that's the kind of thing that we think about, okay? In anaerobic respiration, again, the same steps are taking place, glycolysis, Krebs, and electron transport, the only difference is, is that you don't use oxygen. Oxygen is used in aerobic, anaerobic uses sulfate, nitrate, or carbonate. Okay, so these things are not used during anaero or aerobic respiration. These are used in anaerobic. We cannot do this, so we do not do anaerobic respiration. And again, you can see that the maximum produced is 36, so 36 ATP. This is what we do when we're starved of oxygen. So we go through glucose, make pyruvate through glycolysis, and then that pyruvate is converted through fermentation to the lactic acid. So as our bodies, we produce lactic acid. That's what builds in our muscles. That causes us to cramp up and tighten up, and that's what tells us to stop and breathe. Okay. Other bacteria and yeast and that can actually go through the process of fermentation and generate ethanol and CO2. So this is how we make bread and wine and all those other good things is by using the process of fermentation. So this is a nice little rundown of the differences between those things. So what I'd like you to know on the test is the difference between anaerobic versus or aerobic versus anaerobic and then anaerobic versus fermentation. And so knowing the difference is very key. So again, you may have been taught wrong in the past and I'm not blaming your instructor or anything like that, but you should know the difference between anaerobic respiration and fermentation for this test, okay? All right, so aerobic respiration, again, 
I'm going to go through this quickly because I'm not wanting you to spend a lot of time on the pathways. What I want you to know is what goes in, what comes out. Okay, the first step is glycolysis. And again, glucose is converted to pyruvate. Okay, so that's what goes in. Glucose goes in, pyruvate comes out, and you generate two ATP. So that's the first step here. Okay, where does this take place in the bacteria cell? It takes place in the cytoplasm. So glucose comes into the cell. It's broken down by a series of enzymes. You get pyruvate and it generates two ATP net. So you actually make four, but you lose two. So but we'll just say two ATP, just keep it simple. Okay, and in the process you make pyruvate in the cytoplasm. The next step, which is the Krebs, now this is where it's different. In eukaryotes, this takes place in the mitochondria. In prokaryotes, since they don't have mitochondria, this takes place in the cytoplasm. Again, pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA, goes through the Krebs cycle, and you generate CO2. That CO2 is then given off as waste, Okay, and then what you've done is made intermediates to generate this electron transport. So Krebs cycle, again, takes place in the cytoplasm. What goes in is the pyruvate. What comes out is the CO2. And you generate a little bit of ATP, again, two ATP during this step. And then what you're ready for is the final step, which is electron transport. Now, remember, NADH and FADH are made during these processes. These are the links between the two, three steps. Here's electron transport. These electrons get generated and bounce across the uh, uh, different cofactors or coenzymes in this case, the redox reactions. You push it through, you generate a proton motive force on the top. And so that hydrogen up here generates a very strong positive charge. That positive charge then produces the ATP and we call that electron transport. And I'll show you these things a little bit more detailed here in just a minute. But again, where does this take place? Now in bacteria, they don't have mitochondria, so this takes place in the cell membrane. So this is a big difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes, this takes place in the membrane of the mitochondria. In prokaryotes, this takes place in the cell membrane itself. And so I like to ask that question on the test. Make sure you get it, okay? Where does it take place? All right, so here's glycolysis. And again, this is the steps. Like I said before, this is biochemistry. You guys can learn this in biochemistry. You can learn all the steps and write this out and figure out how many carbons you have throughout the steps. I think that's more for you to learn in biochemistry. What I want you, want you to know is what goes in, which is the glucose. What comes out is the pyruvic acid. If you get that, I'm happy. You know that this process generates two ATP. And where does it take place? In the cytoplasm. And that's it. Just know those things, okay? The next, and let's see the video here. And again, this will show you more in detail, but again, don't worry about all the steps that go along. Cells derive energy from the oxidation of nutrients such as glucose. The oxidation of glucose to pyruvate occurs through a series of steps called glycolysis. The energy released during these oxidation reactions is used to form adenosine triphosphate, ATP, the energy currency of the cell. The initial steps in glycolysis are the additions of two phosphates to the glucose molecule at the expense of two molecules of ATP. The result is a six-carbon sugar diphosphate molecule and two low-energy adenosine diphosphate molecules, or ADP. This six-carbon sugar diphosphate molecule is then split into two three-carbon molecules. Each of the three carbon molecules is converted through a series of steps to pyruvate. During these reactions, electrons are transferred to the coenzyme NAD plus to form NADH, and ATP is formed. Under aerobic conditions, the pyruvate is further oxidized to yield more ATP, and under anaerobic conditions, the pyruvate is converted into lactic acid. Okay, so this again takes you through the whole process. And so again, with glycolysis, what I want you to know is what goes in, glucose, what comes out, pyruvic acid, and then what gets generated to ATP. Where does this take place? In the cytoplasm of the bacteria. That's what I want you to know. So this just kind of gives you a rundown of what it is. Again, very simplistic in this case. Some enzymes are involved and things like this, but that's basically the, the, the parts that I want you to know for glycolysis, okay? Now, with glycolysis, you produce pyruvic acid. And again, the process all depends on oxygen. If oxygen is present, it drives the system and goes into acetyl-CoA, which will then take you into the Krebs if oxygen is present. If oxygen isn't present, 
then you'll go through the process of fermentation. Okay, and so that's another way, and that's where we produce the lactic acid and gas. Other times you go in and make alcohols and things like this, and so that's the process of fermentation. Sometimes the pyruvic acid doesn't even get to acetyl-CoA. If there's enough of the energy being generated, sometimes this pyruvic acid gets sh uh, shuttled off and to form amino acids, sugars, and fat metabolites. So not all of the glucose that gets broken down does get used for ATP. Okay, but most of the time you're going to need a good strong supply of ATP. So it's pretty much going to go in this direction unless oxygen isn't there. All right. All right. So the next step, you get that pyruvic acid and now you're going to go through this process. And so again, you go through the process known as the Krebs cycle. And again, it is a cyclic process, which basically just spins around and around and around as it goes through. Again, I don't want you to know the steps. I just want you to know what goes in pyruvate. Okay, the pyruvate goes in, the CO2 comes out, you generate some ATP, and then where does it take place? It takes place in the cytoplasm of the bacteria. So again, remember, bacteria don't have mitochondria, so it takes place in the cytoplasm. Again, you generate some intermediates, and I don't want you to know the numbers, I just want you to know that these things are generated, and this is the link between the Krebs cycle and electron transport. So we'll look at that in just a minute. Okay, so that that's... Ex basically what I want you to know with the Krebs cycle. Now this is going to be a video talking about mitochondria. So this is eukaryotes. Now I want you to remember bacteria takes place out of the cytoplasm. They don't have these little guys on the inside. So just think of it if you're a bacteria cell just minus the mitochondria even though this is they're going to show you here and how it takes place. During glycolysis glucose is broken down to pyruvate. A two-carbon fragment of pyruvate is used to form acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle, which occurs in the mitochondrion. During the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, carbon dioxide, CO2, is produced and a molecule of NADH is formed. The two-carbon acetyl portion of the acetyl-CoA is transferred to a four-carbon molecule, producing a six-carbon compound the COA carrier molecule is released. Carbon dioxide is then released from the 6-carbon molecule, forming a 5-carbon compound. In this step, hydrogen is removed and transferred to NAD plus to form NADH. Next, a second oxidation and decarboxylation occurs. Again, NADH and carbon dioxide are produced. In addition, a molecule of ATP is produced. As a result of these reactions, a 4-carbon molecule is formed in the Krebs cycle. Finally, the 4-carbon molecule is further oxidized and the hydrogens that are removed are used to form NADH and FADH2. These reactions regenerate the 4-carbon molecule that initially reacts with acetyl-CoA. Each glucose molecule is broken down into two pyruvate molecules during glycolysis. Then, each pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA, which enters the Krebs cycle. Thus, for each glucose molecule, the Krebs cycle must complete two circuits to completely break down the two pyruvate molecules. Okay, and so again, in this one, there's more information than you need to know. The reason why I show this is because I know some of you guys are very visual and you need to see pictures and see videos and things like this. That's why I show you. Just to show you again, Again, think about what goes in. Pyruvate, what comes out, the CO2. ATP is made, so we make two ATP molecules with each turn of the um, Krebs cycle, and then this cycle continues on and on and on. Where does it take place in the bacteria cell? This takes place in the cytoplasm of the bacteria cell. In a eukaryotic cell, this takes place in the mitochondria. So that, again, remember, that's a big difference. And so this video is showing eukaryotic cells, not bacteria cells. All right, and then the final step is the electron transport. So this is where we use our NADHs and FADH2s for, that we generated in glycolysis and then also in the Krebs cycle. And what we do is we generate ATP. So we do this thing called oxidative phosphorylation, and that's because oxygen is used to drive the reaction. And so what happens is the electrons are shuttled from one protein to another in this electron transport chain. And that energy generated by shuttling these things around generates enough 
energy to power ATP synthase. And so the synthase is made, and voila, you generate 34 ATP through this process of one oxygen molecule. And so you can see here, here's the electron transport. And again, remember, this is showing you in the mitochondria of a eukaryotic cell. Where does this take place in the bacteria? This is in the cell membrane, okay? And so these guys shuttle protons outside the cell. Electrons are passed from one protein to another. And eventually what happens is you generate enough protons out here that can generate enough energy to drive this ATP synthase to make ATP. And that's essentially what happens here. You get enough reactions that actually allow you to make 34 ATP. So this is the step where most of your ATP is made. And this is how it's made is during this process, okay? And again, chemoosmosis, this is the process of pumping protons outside the membrane. And so what happens is the hydrogens make up a gradient of hydrogen ions. And this is called a proton motive force. And so that motive force is what's going to drive the ATP synthase. Again, it drives the ATP synthase to generate ATP. And so you generate a boatload of ATP during this process. And so 34 ATP during this process. Okay. Here's the mitochondria, again, showing you, and again, the intermembrane space, the hydrogen ions out there. So these are charge molecules. Those charge molecules then generate and go through the ATP synthase. And what that does is allows for the ATP to be made. And so that's the process in a nutshell right there. Okay. And bacteria, remember bacteria, this takes place in the cell membrane. So here's the cell wall. Here's the cell membrane. Here's where the proton motive force is. There is no mitochondria in bacteria. So remember, it's all in the cell membrane. It's, that's a big difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. No mitochondria. So this takes place in the cell membrane. All right. Again, the final step of the electron transport is generating the oxygen and forming water. These are where your toxic radicals are made because what happens is when you generate the step, you only need half an oxygen. And so what happens during this situation is oxygen gets split into two singlet oxygens, and those singlet oxygens can be toxic. And so when you breathe the oxygen, what happens in your body is the oxygen gets split, that O2 gets split into singlet oxygen, and sometimes those form toxic radicals. Those toxic radicals can build and destroy cells, and that's why these are the, the toxic radicals that can cause cell damage. And essentially, that's why you need enzymes to take care of those things, like superoxide dismutase and catalase that help break these things down. And so we'll talk more about this again. We get into respiration and, and other things where we are when we talk about bacteria cells and oxygen and that stuff. But again, for this step, what we want to know is that, again, we're breaking oxygen down so we can form the ultimate, ultimately water. Okay? All right. And this will show you again the electron transport and the ATP synthase. This is happening in the mitochondria. Remember, you carry out cells. Bacteria, this happens in the cell membrane. So take a look at this. When glucose is oxidized during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, the coenzymes NAD plus and FAD are reduced to NADH plus H plus and FADH2. In the mitochondria, the electrons from NADH plus H plus are transferred to the electron carrier proteins, and the protons are transferred across the membrane. As the electrons move from cytochrome to cytochrome down the electron transport chain, more protons are carried across the membrane. Cytochrome C transfers electrons to the cytochrome C oxidase complex, Protons are also transferred to the outside of the membrane by the cytochrome C oxidase complex. The cytochrome oxidase complex then transfers electrons from cytochrome C to oxygen, the terminal electron acceptor, and water is formed as the product. The transfer of protons generates a proton motive force across the membrane of the mitochondrion. Since membranes are impermeable to ions, the protons that re-enter the matrix pass through special proton channel proteins called ATP synthase. The energy derived from the movement of these protons is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and phosphate. Formation of ATP by this mechanism is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation. 
I like to show this video again because it shows you the whole process. So the electron transport that takes place early on and then that ATP synthase, that production of protons forces it through and that's what generates the ATP. So that causes that configuration or that change. And so that's why this is important. Big, big thing, again, not in the mitochondria, in the cell membrane of prokaryotes. Okay, just remember that. All right, and then the theoretical yield shows you how many ATPs that are made. And again, the biggest thing I want you to know is that during glycolysis and Krebs, you generate two ATP at each time. Okay, and then finally at the end, you generate 34 during um, electron transport. So you can see here, you make 34. So the total that comes out is 38. So two, two, and 34 makes 38. Okay, so which part of the anaerobic or aerobic respiration releases CO2? Okay, so which part of this actually produces the CO2? Give you a second. Okay, you said Krebs cycle, you are correct. Krebs cycle is where your CO2 is made. That's where pyruvate goes in, CO2 comes out, you generate a little ATP, and in bacteria, that takes place in the cytoplasm. All right, now anaerobic respiration, like I said, is very similar to aerobic respiration. It goes through all the same steps, the only difference is what is at the end. Instead of oxygen, you have something else like sulfate, nitrate, or carbonate. And so these things are used as electron acceptors. And again, it's not oxygen, it's something else. And so this allows for those anaerobic bacteria that don't utilize oxygen to live, generating enough ATP to survive by using some other mechanism. And they get these things from the soil or wherever they're found. Most of these guys take these elemental things, bring them into their cells, and then use these things as electron acceptors during the process of, um, of anaerobic respiration, okay? Goes through all the same steps, and you generate 36 ATP. So you minus two, but you get 36 total all the way through, okay? All right, then the last thing is fermentation. Again, fermentation is the process of glucose going to pyruvate. You go through the process of glycolysis, when oxygen isn't present, it goes through fermentation. We do the process known as lactic acid. We produce acid, and so that lactic acid builds up and tells us we need to breathe. In bacteria, some bacteria will produce acids or mixed acids. A lot of them will produce CO2 and alcohol when we do this, especially when we talk about yeast and other things like this. They go through that process, and we utilize these guys to make lots of different products. And again, in this case, you don't completely break anything down. You only produce two ATP, so that is a, a minus for fermentation is that two ATP are made instead of 38. So you can see you're at a big uh, negative about making ATP. So if you see as a big organism like us, only making two ATP, you're not going to last very long. You need those 38 to generate that energy. And so that's why we can go a little ways without making enough ATP, but eventually we have to stop and breathe. And so that's part of the process we start doing fermentations, we need to stop and breathe. Bacteria the same way. Once the alcohol content or the yeast, uh, once the alcohol content gets to a certain percentage, like 10 to 12 percent, 14 percent when you're talking about some of these stronger things, basically what happens is that you start killing the yeast and they can't produce any more alcohol. Okay, And so that's the natural process. Now when you distill things and you get more alcohol, you take water out and things like this, that's how you purify alcohol and you get stronger. And so that's a whole nother topic for another day, but you can kind of see here, this is how fermentation runs. All right, and again, alcoholic and acidic fermentation going through glucose to make pyruvic acid. One side will do acetaldehyde and ethyl alcohol. The other side does lactic acid. In our bodies, our process goes through the lactic acid pathway and other organisms like bacteria, they'll go through the acetaldehyde and ethyl alcohol and yeast and things like this, okay? But you can see the process is pretty much the same. It's just what final product do you get? All right, and then again, pyruvate. Again, different bacteria make different things, and you can see the different types of bacteria and what they produce, and so you can see these different things out here, the lactic acid versus, again, mixed acids. You get acetic acid, enterobacter makes butanediol, proponic acid, clostridium makes buric acid, and yeast makes ethanol. So a lot of different products and things that we use in our daily lives that are actually produced by bacteria and yeast that are done through the fermentation process. So if you like soy sauce and that, that's fermented soybeans if you didn't know that. And so that is the process that 
who use the fermentation process to generate. That's why it's got that bite to it. It's got some alcohol to it. Okay. All right. Okay. So again, comparing aerobic for, uh, respiration to fermentation and anaerobic. Again, you can look at all these things. So aerobic respiration, you go through the three pathways, end up with oxygen, you make ATP, CO2, and water. And again, this is the primary source of energy in these cases. The other type is anaerobic metabolism. Again, most of us will go through fermentation if we're starved of oxygen. This is only glycolysis only. You end up with organic molecules and again, a little bit of ATP, lots of lactic acid and some ethanol depending on what type of organism you are. And again, it all depends on where you are in that, in that system, okay? Respiration is only done by a few, again, only done by the anaerobic and the facultative anaerobes, okay? And they can go through this glycolysis, Krebs, and electron transport. Again, using some inorganic ions instead of oxygen. Again, go through all three steps and generate ATP. And again, this is in the anaerobic bacteria. So what we do is fermentation, not anaerobic respiration, okay? All right. So the last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I promise we're done, is photosynthesis. And again, this is Earth's lifeline. If we didn't have photosynthesis, we wouldn't have the glucose in order to survive. And so the process of photosynthesis is actually taking solar energy from the sun and converting that solar energy into chemical energy that can be used for cellular respiration. And so what the plant does is it converts CO2 along with water, so CO2 from the air, water from the roots using the sunlight and their green chloroplasts convert that into glucose and oxygen. And so these are two important products that we need. This is why we need to eat things that are either our plants themselves or animals that eat plants. And so we get our energy from that. And so ultimately we all get our energy from the sun. It just depends on how long or where in the step of the process that it goes. Whether you're a plant or a bacteria that does this right away and converts the CO2 and water along with sunlight to produce glucose, or you eat these plants or eat animals that eat these plants, that's where you get your glucose from. Okay, and so that's the big, big thing or the big thing that I want you to get out of this. Okay, again, when we talk about photosynthesis, we describe it as two different pathways. There's a light dependent where the sun has to be out. That generates ATP through the process and you basically convert the water to oxygen. This generates ATP so you can do the dark reactions, which is the Kelvin cycle to produce glucose in this process. And again, I don't want you to know anything about this. I'm just bringing it up so that you have some idea about photosynthesis because it's probably not talked very much in most of your science classes. Okay. Again, the light independent are the dark reactions. We call these the Kelvin cycle. This is where CO2 is fixed and converted into glucose using the ATP that is generated from the sunlight that's used in this step. And so we have light and dark reactions in these cases, okay? All right, and then the Kelvin cycle, again, you kind of see where this is going. This kind of looks like the Krebs cycle. And again, what happens is this generates fructose and glucose, which is the sugar of plants. And so this kind of gives you an idea. CO2 comes in, Fructose and glucose comes out, and that's the sugar of plants. And so you can do whether you want to do cell respiration or you store these things and you want maple syrup or other things that you get from your plants. Okay? And so that is photosynthesis in a very quick little synopsis. All right. So the main job of the chloroplast pigments during photosynthesis is what? To capture photons of light, absorb carbon dioxide, fix carbon dioxide, or produce ATP. What is the main job of the chloroplast? Okay, we didn't really talk about this much, but if you said A, capture the photons of light, that is correct, because you need that light in order to generate ATP. I'd even give it if you said produce ATP, because we did talk a little bit about that, but that's really the idea is the pigments in there are to collect the solar energy so that you can convert that solar energy into chemical energy, which is the glucose, okay? Awesome. All right, so we finished this chapter. And so again, we talked a little bit about metabolism. And again, this is all the processes that occur in the cell. We have the two types. We have catabolism, which is breaking things down. So when you break things down like glucose into ATP, or when you're breaking things down like proteins into amino acids or things like that, that is called catabolism. Anabolism is building things up. I always think about anabolic or anabolic steroids, building things up, building muscle. That is anabolism. So that's the way I always think about it. Catabolism is breaking apart. Anabolism is putting together. Okay. 
Another thing we discussed was enzymes. We talked about these. These are protein catalysts that speed up the ability. They're the power tools of the cellular world. Okay, what affects them? Temperature, pH, and the amount. All those different things can affect them. Also think about inhibition. Competitive inhibition is when the inhibitor binds directly to the active site. The non-competitive inhibition is something binds to another site that affects the active site. So make sure you know those two different things. Also know what an active site is. This is where the substrate binds. Also know the difference between a synthesis versus degradation. Synthesis, two substrates, one product. Degradation, one, one substrate, two products. Okay, so think of that and when you go through. We also spent some time on anaerobic respiration. And again, this is using oxygen to generate ATP, going through the process of glycolysis. And again, glycolysis, Krebs, and the electron transport chain. I have 36 here, but if you put 38, I'd be happy if you did that too. So again, 36 to 38 ATP, it's always argued about which one is right and which one. If you're close enough, 36 to 38, I give you the points. Okay, anaerobic respiration, other than oxygen, ATP is generated. Fermentation, pyruvate is broken down in acids and alcohols to AT produced. And then photosynthesis is the generation of glucose from sunlight to solar, solar energy to chemical energy. So now I'm done. I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize I had another slide here. So if you do have any questions about this stuff, like I said, anaerobic is very similar to aerobic. The only difference is, is something other than oxygen. Fermentation is what we do to produce lactic acid. So remember that. And then photosynthesis is the generation of glucose from sunlight. And again, taking solar energy and converting it into uh, glucose and so solar to chemical. Okay, now if you have any questions, please let me know. And again, I thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.